Okay, thanks a lot, John, and uh, thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me. So I'm going to tell you some lessons we learned about porting the ICON model to GPUs. This is work of a lot more people on, than are, are on this slide. I think it's around uh, 60 to 100 now who somehow contributed. And uh, this is a historical perspective. So this was my talk at Multicore One porting ICON non-hydrostatic dynamics to GPUs. Basically, I told people, wow, we ported something to GPUs and aren't we great? Well, a lot has happened since then. So that original prototype, uh, well, actually two prototypes, Akuta Fortran and OpenCL prototypes of the dynamical core or a, a scaled down version of the dynamical core. And uh, subsequently, the ICON developers told us, well, that's really great, but uh, there's no way uh, in, in hell we are ever going to incorporate that into our model, that code into our model. Uh, that gave, led to a paradigm shift. We decided to use open ACC directives, which were uh, encouraged by uh, PGI and uh, Cray at the time. That was part of a PRACE uh, project, PRACE 2IP, uh, one of 15 applications. The dynamical core is one of 15 applications chosen, the full dynamical core. Uh, subsequently, we tried to port the physics of a local area model called ICON HD CP squared. Um, that was unsuccessful for a couple of reasons I will talk about subsequently, but basically that we were lacking component testing infrastructure. Uh, we encouraged uh, a team of uh, Robert Pankus, in particular Mac Norman, who you just heard, uh, to port our TMGP radiation uh, to open ACC. That becomes relevant a little bit later on in the story. There was a subsequent um, Swiss-funded PASC project to port uh, the climate uh, physics, physical parameterizations, with some new tools, which I'll talk about, uh, to GPUs. And that was largely successful, except at the end of 2018, we realized that the attempt to port the existing radiation PSRAD was not going to cut it. It was pl just plain too slow. And then we had to, at very short notice, uh, adopt our TMGP radiation, which was quite an exciting effort in the last month. Uh, there was a final push in 2019. Uh, we had a hackathon, to, uh, an intensive effort to incorporate the radiation, additional optimization and so forth. And in 2020, we went into production with the QBO simulations. I've given this talk so often that I don't want to give you the technical talk, but just give you some uh, lessons I've learned personally and some stories behind them. Uh, first, it would be remiss of me not to say something about these QBO simulations since I mentioned them in the previous slide. The QBO is a uh, physical phenomenon where the zonal wind, or if you like, prevailing westerlies and prevailing east easterlies shift from east to west and west to east in on a two year uh, uh, period. Uh, they work themselves down from the top of the atmosphere to the bottom of the atmosphere in time. Um, it's uh, not thoroughly understood, the QBO phenomenon. Uh, what uh, this QBO project is uh, looking at is whether uh, in a warmer climate, QBO will become faster, or slower, stronger, weaker, etc. what the effects are on the troposphere. Uh, and uh, current simulations are giving contradictory an answers. Therefore, um, the, uh, the project proposed requires a, a two-year simulation, clearly, because it's uh, biennial, and uh, requires deep convection with a very high vertical resolution here, 180 layers, and um, uh, at a very high resolution. And if you work out the numbers based on some preliminary runs, uh, basically this, this two-year simulation is about two million node hours on uh, pit stained, our, uh, our, um, our main platform. Uh, the price allocation was more than that to do resolu uh, uh, lower resolution runs in total 3.2 million node hours. In other words, a very large allocation 
on our uh, main platform. Um, what is the status of the GPU port? Well, the non-hydrostatic dynamics, as mentioned, including the dynamical core, advection, and diffusion, were ported quite a long time ago. Uh, there's Graupel microphysics. Um, uh, there's a land model called JS Bach. I'll mention a little bit more about that. Convection turbulence, the radiation I mentioned. And also there's all the infrastructure, including the communication, including uh, GPU direct communication. Uh, there's post post-processing to calculate time means, vertical uh, interpolations. And now there's a very important GRIB2 compression running on the GPU, which allows us to drastically reduce the, the uh, resulting output data, the diagnostics. Um, this is one of several uh, talks uh, at the bottom, uh, which we've given on the uh, uh, ICON, uh, ICON effort. Um, right, so yeah, we have benchmarks. I'll just briefly tell you before I get to the lessons, I'll just briefly tell you about the performance. Basically, all components are memory bandwidth bound. Uh, we've tested on the uh, GPU partition of Pitts Daint, which has, uh, for, uh, for, in terms of CPUs, one Haswell uh, a socket. There's also a, a multi-core uh, um, partition of Pitts Daint with two Broadwell sockets, so a little bit faster than the Haswells, each a little bit has faster than the Haswell. And the GPU partition, of course, has uh, uh, NVIDIA P100 GPUs. And basically, the story is pretty straightforward. So these are, are uh, pretty much a full single node run, filling the node uh, uh, as much as we can. And there's a, more than a factor of two between uh, one Haswell socket and two Broadwell sockets, roughly what you would imagine. And then another jump of two and perhaps a little bit more uh, between the, the dual Broadwell and the uh, P100 uh, uh, GPU. For almost all their components, there are some exceptions. The output is one exception. Fortunately, the output is done in an asynchronous mode on on IO nodes and which with very, very little overhead. In other words, is the uh, IO nodes can keep up with the computation. Um, right, this is, uh, these are our strong scaling results. So we have four here. The blue is a um, uh, single socket Haswell. The red is uh, dual Broadwell. Uh, the green is uh, P100 with classical uh, communication where we pass, we, where we do the um, uh, halo exchanges by updating on the CPU, MPI communication on the CPU, then updating on the GPU. We also have a mode uh, or GPU direct communication. Um, what, do you, what can you see here? The bottom line is that the strong scaling on the CPU is very good. The strong scaling, scaling on the GPU is slightly less good um, as the GPU slowly has less and less work to do. Um, the runs, uh, the, the um, GPU direct runs are in general slightly faster than the classical uh, updates on the CPU. And basically the critical runs, which are at 2048 nodes, uh, for the 2.8 uh, kilometers. Uh, you can't really see it, but the uh, GPU direct communication does give you an advantage of about 10%. So uh, that's to our, uh, our strong scaling results for the end-to-end -end model on, uh, on, uh, on Pitt Staint, our main platform. So let's get to the lessons and maybe I can tell you a, a few stories as I do this. So the first lesson is that global, the global part of the coordinating strategy is not perhaps what you would use in individual parts of the code. And the dynamics uh, had a triple loop structure over a set of blocks, uh, over the number of levels and over some sort of vector link or block length 
uh, in the third loop. So this is a very classical way to um, uh, organize calculations. We tried to get parallelism over all three by using a gang parallelism over the blocks and vector parallelism over the collapsed uh, vector length and, uh, and number of levels. Um, that worked great for the, that uh, initial version of the dynamical core. Unfortunately, the physics has a slightly different structure. Uh, it has uh, open MP parallelism at a very high level where you call usually multiple levels of subroutines and far, far below that you get to this vector parallelism over all the levels and over the block length. Now, that's a little bit unfortunate. This, in, this particular example has a vertical dependency, so it's a so-called um, uh, column model. Um, the ACC compiler can't handle the three-level parallelization when there are so many layers. We figured that out very quickly. We thought of a solution where we try, would try to do OpenMP at the high level and OpenACC at a lower level. It's not currently standard compliant. It does work, but not compliant. Um, so the only option we felt safe was with was to have a very large block size, preferably one single block and one very one single very large block. In other words, an n-proma of the total number of columns, and that basically forces us, as as mentioned, to turn everything, all our columns, into one long block. Um, unfortunately, that required us to refactor the dynamical core, so you always throw away one implementation, and that's what we did. Here was the original OpenMP code, here's the uh, OpenACC code, which essentially I've shown you in the previous slide with this three levels of parallelism, and this was refactored to uh, only uh, GPU parallelism over this collapsed loop, albeit with a very large block size of n proma. So that was our first lesson that uh, uh, you can't expect your uh, initial uh, strategy to be the right one. The second lesson, don't use unsupported extensions. We used a uh, unsupported Cray feature to do a full automated deep copy in Fortran, um, basically passing very, very complicated derived types just before uh, and after the uh, time loop. Um, and that is nice in principle. Of course, it didn't work. We had to uh, apply some massaging to actually get it to work. In the end, we did get that to work. Um, unfortunately, like I said, it's not supported. First, it's not supported, and it's not part of the OpenACC standard. So um, we had to think about that. So it, it was an unsupported feature, as I mentioned. Uh, it was uh, the full automated deep copy was proposed for the standard standard committee. Uh, considered it in a very protracted discussion in 2018. We stopped waiting and we implemented the copies by hand, which gave us literally hundreds of lines of not so nice codes where we had to copy in uh, each individual field in these derived types. Uh, not the most elegant solution, but one which works and is standard compliant. Uh, I'll get to uh, this point. Ultimately, all the CC specific, Cray specific code was removed. I'll get to that point in a second. Um, in fact, right now, the participation of a compiler vendor is crucial for success. And I'll tell you a little bit about the Cray story. First, uh, we were impressed by uh, Cray's enthusiasm in around 12, 2012 timeframe to open ACC. We were convinced by that, that this was the way to go. Um, in fairness, uh, Luis de Rose of Cray did intimate a slow shift at Cray already in 2015 from open ACC to open MP. Uh, and officially Cray announced that open ACC wouldn't be supported in 
uh, CC 9.0 uh, and onward. Um, well, there was only one other player in town at the time, at least. That was PGI. Unfortunately, PGI, uh, for the longest time, could not compile ICON on, on CPUs. We're very appreciative of Dave Norton, who spent about a year tracking down compiler bugs, reporting them. And finally, in 2018, PGI could compile the CPU code. Obviously, we needed the PGI compiler for the GPU code. Um, there were issues with OpenACC Atomics in, with the PGI compiler. They, the uh, index list generation was far too slow. However, NVIDIA PGI kindly uh, offered us uh, support through Dmitry Alexev, who replaced the Atomics with calls to the CUB library. That's something which I wouldn't be qualified to do. He did. He also, in addition, introduced a asynchronous uh, um, uh, execution of kernels and other optimizations, particularly in RTMGP. And frankly, we could not have done the job without Dimitri's help. So very, very thankful to uh, uh, NVIDIA for all their help. Um, this uh, sh uh, is another lesson, GPU porting has to be embedded in code development. Uh, so we've been fortunate to be an accepted member of the ICON development team. We're gatekeepers for GPU development. We had to install our BuildBot server on Pitstaint. Uh, that is a graphic which I just cut and pasted today. Uh, running uh, the GPU code and the GPU channel of BuildBot uh, to prove that these some eight, seven, eight tests are actually working. The GPU test suite, suite has to pass, including on GPU, to commit any, uh, anything to the release candidate. Um, in addition, we've tried to help uh, uh, the, uh, the effort by giving GPU programming ha uh, hackathons uh, holding them with the uh, uh, ICON development team, which has been very, very successful. Um, lesson four, scientists are not software engineers. Surprise, surprise, ICON developers do not write unit tests when they develop code. They just incorporate new features directly into the model, maybe with a nameless flag to toggle them on and off. But uh, this causes considerable difficulty. For example, uh, if you want to test out that feature, it requires a compilation of all of ICON. Now remember, PGI was not compiling ICON at the time, right? For the longest time. Um, moreover, it's much easier to port code if you have some sort of standalone application, which tests only that feature. And there were some tools which were developed uh, in the framework of other projects, grid tools, which was mentioned in Sergey's talk brief briefly. This is called Serial Box uh, to serialize data from a program, including um, uh, a, uh, a preprocessor, preprocessor directives, which can be parsed to generate code, and also uh, something I'll, uh, called the Fortran Test Generator which I will mention in the subsequent slide. This is the work of Christian Hoffi for his um, uh, dissertation. Basically, Fortran Test Generator can uh, runs the full application, captures the data which is passed to a particular subroutine, STRW, for example, serializes it with that serial box I mentioned previously, uh, serializes the input, serializes the output, and then in another mode can create replay code with a, a simple test driver, not so simple it turns out, but a, a test driver, which actually only calls that subroutine. Uh, this was extremely helpful for the physical parameterizations where we had to make standalones and and incrementally uh, uh, implement those with um, or report those with open ACC directives. We could not have done it without these standalone uh, test cases. Uh, I should mention in the same breath that there's a similar framework, uh, KGen, uh, and uh, where the ideas are quite similar to extract kernels. Um, lesson five. 
great tools require great maintenance and support. So we have a great tool. It's called CLAW. It's a source to source translator. It's based on the Omni compiler. This is a long term effort in Japan. It uh, supports Fortran, which supports Fortran 2008. Uh, we needed the front end of the Omni compiler. It's one of the few Fortran front ends which were available at the time. Uh, this is a, a GitHub effort uh, available in the public domain. And basically, it's a source to source translator to generate open ACC or open MP directives on the fly uh, with a couple of directives, CLAW directives in um, uh, ag uh, architecture agnostic uh, uh, Fortran code. Now, there's, it has something called a single um, uh, column abstraction, um, which I will talk about in the subsequent slide. Uh, and this work has obviously been uh, published now in several uh, forums. The single column dependency, uh, single column abstraction is uh, a way we believe scientists would prefer to develop their column and box models and ignore parallelization, separation of concerns. They concentrate on their single column model, which you see inside the, the loop, do loop. And then CLAW uh, offers some directives to tell um, uh, the back end how many of these columns actually need to be processed. For example, one to n proma. Um, this works uh, work quite well in simple prototype examples. Uh, this is a turbulence, a turbulent diffusion, where we could uh, attain uh, similar performance to handwritten OpenMP code on the CPU, similar or even better performance to handwritten, uh, handwritten OpenACC code, even though the resulting code differed quite considerably, similar performance. Um, and this was applied to the JSBach land surface model in, uh, in ICON, which is again, uh, goes through many layers of, of subroutines before you finally get to uh, some sort of elemental uh, subroutines at the bottom level operating only on scalars. These require a few Cray, uh, so, sorry, CLAW um, uh, uh, directives. Um, and the resulting performance after uh, quite a bit of work uh, showed us we could attain consistently a factor of five or even somewhat more over the uh, single socket Haswell uh, CPU code. A factor, again, which you've seen in some of the previous, uh, uh, previous slides. But requires great maintenance and support. The person who developed CLAW has now left. We have a stopgap solution of one year uh, follow on funding to fund someone to support CLAW, but we're currently looking for long term support for CLAW. It's a great tool, but it can only remain a great tool if we find a way to finance the maintenance of it. Okay, uh, plan for a follow on strategy. Um, I think this uh, adds on to the talk of Sergey that exclaim and easy ways to projects include packages on a DSL development like Sergey's work. Um, it's uh, Meteo Swiss, which is actually uh, leading the effort on this. And basically there are multiple possible DSL front ends. You again see uh, among others, a Python DSL front end, uh, but also CLAW, which I mentioned before, a high level IR, which was mentioned in Sergey's talk, some intermediate stages with checkers and optimizers and code generation on the back end. Um, for example, as I said before, for uh, a native Fortran code, possibly with OpenACC or OpenMP directives or grid tools. I won't uh, mention anything about grid tools here uh, beyond the fact that it's a set of libraries and utilities for performance portable applications in uh, climate and weather. Um, also available in the public domain, as is uh, Grid Tools for Python, which is, as mentioned, this Python DSL front end. Um, plan and exit strategy. So I'm running out of time slowly, 
but these are simple examples which Matthias Swiss has presented on simple operators uh, with a, uh, um, a Python-like syntax um, over the icon grid, which of course consists of uh, 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 triangular cells, their vertices and edge points. There's something called a Dawn compiler, which can generate uh, multiple things on, for the back end. Um, and they've tested the, this on a classical example, the Laplace operator, um, and uh, achieved at least uh, open ACC performance on their test examples. Finally, you can't forget the customer's needs. Um, Icon Climate, we've ported that. That's useful for a subset of our, our uh, climate customers. However, there's also Icon NWP. Uh, Meteo Swiss is actively porting that to GPUs in preparation for their shift to Icon in 2022. Icon Ocean, we're hoping for possible port by the German Climate Computing Center uh, to open ACC. They seem interested in doing that. Uh, there is an aerosol chemistry and cloud, aerosol cloud interactions code called Hamots that's financed by a one-year extension to the PASC pro project previously mentioned. Um, and there's a uh, more full uh, aerosol and reactive trace gases with full chemistry. And that will probably lead to a new PASC funded, Swiss funded project uh, using either CLAW or OpenACC. So the take home messages, uh, just briefly, uh, we are running in production with these QBO simulations at five and 2.8 kilometers. Uh, I've mentioned the lessons I've learned in this long process. And uh, finally, um, again, thanks to the organizers. It's been a difficult time for everyone with COVID. I just like to ask if or, or propose if there it would be possible to have a virtual component to future multi-core uh, workshops. Our budget travel budget has been cut by uh, one third, uh, ignoring the fact that we have not been able to use our uh, funding, our travel funding for 2020. And of course, we are from the uh, climate community. So with that, I will end and take questions. Okay. As standards commitment, yes. <laughs> um, we, we push them very hard. Uh, sorry, the question is, has the OpenACC Standards Committee made any progress on deep copies? They have. It will presumably go into OpenACC 3.0 and uh, unfortunately, we will no longer use it because we've transitioned to a manual deep copy. Uh, could you comment on the amount of human effort involved in the overall project? Thanks very much for that question. It's very large. So I've put in perhaps uh, three years of my time, three to four years of my time. And then there have been other efforts with probably five to eight FTEs. So we're talking on the magnitude of 10 FTEs over the years. For the CLAW application in the LAN model, do you notice any memory or register issues when the multiple level subroutines are going to kernel? We do notice performance issues in some cases, not in those um, idealized examples performance is less than you saw there. I cannot speak for Valentin Clement who did that work and therefore I have to pass on that question. Thanks very much. I hope I'm in time. <laughs>